Can you guys hear now? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Yeah, we, we were all muted. <laughs> we're now, just... we're all, now we're all getting there. So I said we're kind of all in a learning curve because we're all of us are now teleworking, right? So we're at home using our using our computers, and so it's a we're in a whole new world here. But we're all learning together, and I think it's going pretty well. Good. Um, for those of you who just joined us, we're giving it a few more minutes because we have so many folks jumping on um, at the same time. So. Um, we had sold this event out at 500, um, and there are lots of you trying to jump on right now. So um, we're going to give it just one more minute, um, and then uh, Allie will get us started um, with everything. And if you have not um, seen the poll yet, uh, please take a second to answer those couple of questions so we know who we're talking to. Um, and we'll get started in just a second. Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, people, I see people are still logging on, um, but I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions for everybody. Uh, welcome to today's ELGL webinar, Navigating COVID-19 Grant Funding. I'm ELGL Digital Coordinator, Allie Breyer, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's presentation. ELGL is the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. We engage the brightest minds in local government. One of the ways we do this is to provide exceptional and free online training about local government. We have online opportunities every week right now as a result of COVID-19, but um, during the year we have lots of in-person events um, and webinars, trainings, um, and all types of content as well. A reminder that we have a special landing page focused on the COVID-19 pandemic on elgl.org slash COVID-19. This will be an interactive webinar with opportunities for you to comment and ask questions using the chat box on the side of your screen. Your microphones and conference phones are disabled for this webinar due to the large number of participants. This makes the webinar enjoyable and efficient for everyone. You will have the ability to submit questions throughout the presentation through the chat box where we will manage and facilitate them um, at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to all the questions, we'll include them on the webinar recording and send them out to all registrants by close of business on Friday. The webinar will also be posted on our website. We'll be live tweeting today's webinar so you can follow along with the hashtag, hashtag ELGL webinar. And today we're excited to welcome Maria Houth, Francesca L. Otrish, UK Geofo, and our very own Ellie, Emily, sorry, Emily Edmonds to this ELGL webinar. Now let's go ahead and introduce our speakers and then I will pass it off to them. Maria comes from the tribal government sector and is a proud member of the Tracta Nation of Oklahoma. As eServices customer success tribal specialist, Maria brings expert knowledge of grants and tribal government. She views all grants awarded to tribes as opportunities to provide better services, help further the quality of life and protect tribal culture for tribal members and their communities. 
She's a certified grant management specialist from the National Grants Management Association, where she serves on their board of directors and is active in many committees. As eCivis's content marketing manager, Francesca is a well versed is well versed in SEO led content creation and passionate about storytelling. She has a wide range of domain expertise and has written for marketing agencies, government, B2B, and B2G organizations. Her specialties include strategic thought leadership through the extensive writing of short form and long form cop copy, include including executive bylines, blogs, white papers, ebooks, ad copy, web, and video content on a wide range of topics, including tech policy, marketing, cybersecurity, government grants management, and more. And lastly, Emily Edmonds is the membership and programs director at ELGL. She spent her career in local government and nonprofit work, focusing primarily on building relationships between rural and urban communities and advocating for policies that support underserved rural populations. She holds an MPA from UNC Chapel Hill, where she completed her graduate thesis on modern approaches to rural economic development. In her consulting career, she specialized in grant writing, food systems assessment, cross-sector engagement, and program management. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll let them pass it off, or I'll pass it off to them. Thank you. Hi, all. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I am. Very good. So thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we did have the polling question, and it kind of gives us an idea of who we're talking to today, and, and it's kind of not a surprise that we have the cities and the counties are our major, our major ones. Uh, we did have earlier, it was about 10% nonprofit, now it's down to about eight. So you guys are, of course, the local government, the cities and counties. Um, and then we also have, to me, this is no surprise over who the, um, the personas are. It's the boots on the ground people that, you know, we have, we do have some elected officials and some executives, but it's the program managers and the analysts um, and the administrative help that really uh, help see these programs through. We also have um, experience in grants. So the first two, you have several years, you know, you, some of it, the paperwork scares you. These are great. At least you're not totally surprised by all this. The one that resonates with me from 2008 is the one I'm terrified, even though there's money on the way and I don't know how much or any experience with this. That was uh, a, probably 90% of us back in the R days in 2008. So we feel your pain. So let's help uh, minimize that and we'll get you guys, we'll get you guys going. So we're very grateful to be here to discuss this with you guys. Um, as the HHS secretary said, state and local governments are, on the, are the backbone of our public health system. They have been essential partners in the ongoing work to contain and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in the US. That's why we're here today is because of the COVID-19 and all the emergency funding that's come around it. So we do recognize how important it is uh, for you guys during this pandemic, the pressure you're feeling, the grants that are coming down and how you can quickly get the cash and utilize it in your communities. So <clears throat> under the CARES Act in, the, in Title V, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, that's where everyone's talking about the $150 billion that was allocated for states and local. And they always usually say states and local governments, but there's also tribal and territory governments that were um, included in that. So if you broke it down, you have $139 billion that went to the states and the local governments, which are the unit of local governments are the, the 500 thousand population or more. If you guys didn't know that, we can go into it a little bit. Each state will receive at least $1.25 billion. That's each state. So the cities and counties within that state that are over 500 population will also get funded and that will come off of the top of that $1.25 billion. Like I said, that's a minimum. There's only, I saw the list yesterday, uh, there was few, uh, there was only 1.25 billion. The majority of them, of course, are more because it's population based. So we do give an example. Um, New Mexico has a relatively low state population of around 2.1 million people. They're expected to receive a minimum of 1.25 billion. So out of that 2.5 billion, some of it will go to the city of Albuquerque, but it depends on their population. 
So if you need help on how to break that down or to know if you're eligible for that, uh, there is a list out there on the U.S. Treasury's website that gives the list of all the this, this counties and cities that are the 500 population and more. And we could see if you'll email, we can send it to you. Then there's the $8 billion that are eligible to the tribes. Now this will go also based on population. And this is the only one where it won't be a direct uh, from the Secretary of Treasury. This will actually, the Secretary of Treasury and the Secretary of the Interior are having consultations with the tribes right now to, depend, to, de, to decide how to uh, distribute that funding. And so that's, that, I've been on a couple of those calls and it's real, uh, it's real interesting. Lastly, the territory. So these are the, the District of Columbia and the five U.S. territories, which will receive three billion of that. And again, it's based on population. There is another list on uh, U.S. Department of Treasury that has how much uh, each, each territory will get. Now, as you navigate the funding coming through your way, there are some questions you're going to ask. And the, how is the, the award is coming out. We don't have anything to have to apply for. You, know, you don't have to apply for this funding. How do you put a project together or where is this funding going to go? And this is some of the same things we did during the RF, RFAs where you get the funding and then you, you find out where the biggest need is and that's your project. So keep that in mind. How do we track and manage these incoming grants? Uh, you track separately generally. You'll want to track your COVID because of the reporting. Now the, the Friday they released M20-21 OMB did that get, gives some of the, the reporting guidelines to the agencies and those of course will funnel down to us as recipients. So start kind of putting a, a plan in place on how you're going to track those. How do we make sure that we're staying compliant? So compliance is a huge issue. You don't, there's going to be a lot, uh, probably, and I know there was no IG on the, on the list today, um, hopefully back that up, that there are um, going to be some more compliance reviews on this kind of funding because we really have to show the public where their tax dollars are going. And it says, someone asked uh, if we could explain what R stands for. It's the, the Recovery Act that we had back in 2008, the stimulus funds that we had, uh, the American Recovery uh, Act. So was it Revitalization Recovery Act? See, it's been so long. So that was the same funding that we had back then. It was a, another stimulus. Yep, you're right, Maria. Yep. So we want to help you guys prepare and be ready to address these questions uh, through this presentation. So on March 19th, OMB issued a new executive memo uh, to expand the scope of recipients affected by the loss of operational capacity and increased costs. And all of this, of course, due to COVID-19. I don't know how many people out there are grant nerds like me, but when as soon as this came out, I was all over it and reading it and analyzing it. Um, and so that's how we were able to help put this together for you guys. So federal agencies can offer relief for administrative financial management and audit requirements under 2 CFR, 2 CFR Part 200, the Uniform Guidance or <clears throat> Super Circular, however you guys talk about it. And what it did was, one, the SAM registration and renewal. Uh, if you, you have to be registered in SAM before you could even apply for an award. <clears throat> well, with this new tweak, you don't have to be registered at the time of your application. But by the time they award you the funding, you have to be uh, registered. And the current registrants who are active with an expiration date of May 16th, they'll get a one-time 60-day extension. So there's a lot around the SAM. There's also flexibility with application deadlines. So agencies can provide flexibility in application submissions. Agencies would list their guidance, of course, on the website and the contact information for the officials. So what they can do is a lot of it has to do with the non-competing uh, applications. So look that up and read that too, and we can help you with that. Uh, no cost extensions. The awards that were still active as of March 31st, scheduled to expire on or before December 31st of this year, may receive, may, doesn't say will, may receive an automatic 12-month no cost extension. Now these will be determined by the agencies, of course, so always my famous saying is 
always ask your agency what their what their guidelines are. Uh, Non-competitive continuation grants, we talked about this a while ago, that they're going to make that a more um, brief statement now that you have to send in to verify uh, that, that your recipient, you as a recipient, that you can resume or restore your project activities and accept the continuation award. So if you don't have the capacity to accept that award, you know, you may, you may not need it. You may have to give it back. Uh, expenditures for salaries and other, and other project activities, you guys need to look that up and really learn that about it. You'll find it to CFR 200.302, where we talk about um, documented costs, the time and effort, really watch your time and effort on this one too, because there are a few, um, a few changes and a few allowability of costs that have changed just a little bit. Uh, allowability of costs not normally charged to an award. They may allow a recipient to charge costs incurred by cancellations of grant-related events. So your travel, if you had a conference you were going to and it was canceled, they may allow that expense to stay uh, charged to the grant. Uh, a conference that you pe were paying for with the grant, they may allow that to stay on there. Other activities that have to do with that, that were, you know, would not normally be charged to an award. Pri uh, little side note, some of them that you know are not acceptable ever, they're still not acceptable, like your alcohol or your, you know, stuff like that. So they're not saying it's totally lax. Uh, the prior approval requirements may be waived to allow the recipient to address response more effectively. So the costs will have to remain consistent with the cost principles and the guidelines, but they can be, they can be waived a little bit on your, on your, if you have a more emer emergent situation come up, that way you can respond more effectively uh, to the situation. Exemptions of certain procurement requirements under 2 CFR 231, 2, 2 CFR 200.231B. So the geographic location or just the 321 dealing with the small minority businesses, some of those may be waived because they know you have to get those products in there. A lot of it has to do with this PP&E that, that we're seeing that people are having a hard time getting. Extension of financial reporting and other reporting. They are allowing some delays uh, if there was an interruption. Um, drawdowns won't be interrupted if the delay is allowed by an agency, but if there's a delay in your activity, uh, you need to contact your agency, of course, and see what their guidelines are. But finance and other reports may be allowed an additional three months to submit. All right, moving on. Extension of current approved indirect cost rate. So awarding agencies may allow grantees to continue to use the currently approved indirect cost rate to recover their indirect costs on federal awards. So if you don't have a, a new approved rate, they may allow you to continue using your, your currently approved rate. May also approve grantee requests for an extension of the indirect cost rate proposal submission to finalize the current rates and establish future rates. So you could get an extension uh, for your current rate. Extension of closeout. Awarding agencies may allow the grantee to delay submission of any pending financial. So basically what they're understanding is that there's a lot of activity going on. There's a lot of people not in the office. Uh, things are getting delayed. The delay in submitting closeout reports may not exceed one year after the award expires. Extensions of single audit submission. Those who have not yet filed their single audit with the Federal Audit Clearinghouse and have a financial uh, year end through June 30th of this year should receive a six month extension beyond the normal due date. Uh, this, and even though it's delayed, you will not be put, you will not, it will you'll not jeopardize your low risk auditee. So if you're a low risk auditee and you file late, it's not gonna jeopardize that. You can still qualify to be a low risk auditee. As stated in the memorandum, uh, similar administrative relief listed, it was listed in M20-11. So that was the first memo that came out. This M20-17, which is the one that lists all these, uh, came out after and kind of expanded on them. We, we expected it and we were glad to see it come out. Awarding agencies will post guidance uh, and 
contact the recipient. So if your federal agencies haven't been in contact with you already, I'm sure they will be. And I, I would almost bet that every one of you have already received emails from your agencies. If you haven't, reach out to them, see what they want to say. Which type of agency at the state level would need to contact for municipalities? We'll find that out. Contact the state, um, your state budget office. That would be a good place to start. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Frances uh, Fran, I don't call her Francesca, sorry. Okay, Fran, it's your turn. Uh, she's gonna give us some best practices and show us how to start, uh, that we can start applying. Over to you. You there, Fran, are you muted? Everyone can hear me now, hopefully. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Maria. Um, so as the situation continues to evolve, it's critical that you manage these opportunities effectively. As, um, as Maria was just going over, there will likely be enhanced compliance and reporting requirements. Um, so we sort of broke down these steps to help you research, manage, track, and report on these new funding opportunities while ensuring you're ready for any compliance and reporting obligations as you go. Um, so step one, assemble your grants management team. Step two, prepare your budget appropriation and spending authority. Step three, maximize your funding. Step four, revisit cost allocation plans and negotiated indirect cost rate. Step five, prepare for the Inspector General. Um, so let's go ahead and break down each step um, a little more in depth. So starting with step one, you first need to establish the proper leadership, especially during these stressful and difficult times. Um, as you work toward establishing control around oversight, transparency, and accountability, you need a centralized office or at the very least a grants management team. So this team should be comprised ideally of people who have the right communication and grants management skills to help you steer the ship, so to speak, as you navigate incoming funds you'll be receiving. So these critical people you need on your team include, number one, your grants manager. This is one of the most important people on your team when it comes to ensuring compliance and adhering to the nitty gritty details of grant funding requirements. Details like when the grant starts and ends, what the grant covers and what it doesn't, the reporting requirements and frequency, evaluation criteria, and whether there are matching requirements and what those entail. Next, there's your coordinating officer. This person manages at the organizational level from start to finish. So they'll basically be your point person at every step in the grants process. Um, ideally, they should have enough seniority to affect policy and make decisions on behalf of your agency or department. For example, they could be authorized to approve your COVID-19 applications or projects, speak before local legislature, legislators and elected officials, and um, they could even coordinate organization-wide strategy and long-term planning sessions. Then you have your senior procurement officer. Um, as most of you probably already know, this person provides cradle to grave assistance with the subaward and sub subcontracting and procurement support for grant funding. Um, because they will be coordinating um, all this activity during crises and emergencies, in this case, the pandemic, obviously, you'll really want someone who's a senior level procurement professional. Then last, but certainly not least in importance is your internal auditor. You want to make sure this person is proactively engaged by your grants management team, particularly the grants coordinator. So they need to be aware of the grants activity and provide general guidance to ensure you're creating a clear audit trail and that you're staying in compliance. They should be able to look at the entire process from a macro level while being unbiased and provide that level of situational awareness for the team. For example, whether there are any changes in COVID-19 funding legislation or overall requirements. Um, so next, uh, we'll have Maria go ahead and break, us, um, break down step two for us. I always forget to unmute, forgive me. Thanks, Fran. So step two, we're going to prepare the budget and spending uh, with your spending authority. So because of this pandemic and the importance of the effective targeted response, the last thing we want is to rush in and get, the, get our hands on that funding 
and not have a, pan, a plan in place um, for all the appropriations. And your spending authority needs to be set out. So these plans will form the basis to support requests for special appropriation or contingency contracts, regardless of whether you're trying to designate more sites to isolate effective patients, procure more equipment, or establish screening centers. So when you get into this, we're gonna break down this funding. Of the $150 billion for the state, local, tribal, and territory, uh, there was, there was, we broke that down earlier, there's 139 billion, then there's the 8 billion and the 3 billion, but outside of that realm, there's other funding that have been, has been declared uh, by this. So FEMA, and it says 40 billion, but there was actually 45 billion um, appropriated for disaster relief fund, which that is the fund that just today, they said that the disaster relief fund is on a lapse or it's, is that the one? Let's see, 45 billion, I'm sorry for the SBA, the 45 billion for the SBA, SBA loans has, they're not receiving any more applications right now because there is a lapse in appropriations. So the FEMA funding is 45 billion for the disaster relief fund. They have an additional 45 million for just their operations, but the 45 billion is what we'll be working on for the disaster relief. Then the SBA loans, it says 7 billion. There was actually 17 billion in business loans, uh, 349 billion in business loan for the project account. 10 billion in the emergency, uh, the economic injury disaster loan. That's the one that they are not taking any more applications because it ran out of money. Um, it's actually the, the other one, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. That Correct. That's the one that ran out of money. Yeah. yeah. And, but the, we'll talk about that though. And yeah, we'll get it. But the EIDL, that um, economic injury disaster loan, I saw a post earlier, I saw, well, I read it on SBA where there is no applications being taken right now because there was a lapse in appropriations. So you might pass that down and be, be mindful of that also. Um, where are we? Lastly, most of you have probably heard about the initial uh, coronavirus funding bill of 8.3 million. It included 2.2 billion funding for the CDC. Now of this, this 2.2 billion, 950 million of it is specifically for grants and cooperative agreements with states, local, tribal organizations, urban Indian health organization, as well as other health service providers to tribes. So 950 million is a lot of money, but I don't think, I think that we all know that, that, that it's, it may run out just like the others. We're seeing this money run out pretty quick. A lot of numbers to remember but hopefully this will help clarify a little bit of what's available to, at, from the governor right now. There are, you can go on and read the bill and there's actually a breakdown. You can, you can go through it and break down how much for each. There's a lot of information on different websites out there and we're always here to help uh, get that going too. So Francesca, you wanna break down step number three? Absolutely, and can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, Right, so now that you have a better sense of who you need on your grants team and a better sense of uh, sort of the breakdown of the latest numbers in terms of funding sources available to you, um, let's go over how you can maximize that funding. The bottom line here is that as chaotic as times are, you really need to consider the long term and not just short term of obtaining funding. That means preparing for a timeline of at least six months in advance and making sure your plans align with attainable and sustainable goals and metrics for your agency or department. You'll really want this funding to serve you both during and well after the pandemic. So in doing so, you'll wanna emphasize goals and metrics since the CARES Act really focuses on these attributes. Knowing this, you'll want your program and financial reports to reflect goals and metrics in a very easy to read manner. Um, so when reviewing your reports as a team, you'll wanna double check that everyone is on the same page and that you address the following. Show that adequate progress is being made, ensure there are no compliance issues, and provide relevant information for performance measures specific to COVID-19 guidance. Um, 
ultimately keeping communication lines open between compliance and implementation staff will be very important during this time as you'll want to ensure your grants are being properly managed in line with the requirements outlined in, in COVID-19 grants agreements. Um, so once again, I will pass it back to Maria who's going to help us break down step four. We've got a volley going today, don't we? All right, on step number four, thanks Fran, by the way. So as I mentioned earlier, the tendency for us um, with all this chaos of emergency crisis is to react now and figure it out later. Uh, but it's best to put these practices into place and get a system or at least a methodology that can help capture expenditure data uh, to support cost allocation plans and indirect cost rates on an ongoing basis. So what you don't want to run into is a situation where you don't know how much you've already spent in order to execute your emergency grant programs. So now more than ever, every dollar counts. So your cost allocation plan must be ready to uh, ready by obtaining the right information regarding costs, establishing policy mandates, and navigating emergency funding. What we have here on this slide is a figure to help give you a better understanding of the full picture of cost allocation, although this is a basic snapshot of what grantors and grantees need to consider. So from the start, what can be accomplished with the grant funds to navigate the notice of funding opportunity all the way to the audit and closeout? Did you get the full reimbursement of the grant? Did you fully spend it down? Is there any way to access more funding? Then on the grantee side, you're considering what did it cost to perform the grant? Did you receive full reimbursement? Uh, did you receive, did you recover the full opportunity of the award? So as, as you can see, the way we break this down is the full life cycle of the grant management for both the grantor and the grantee and all the considerations that you'll need to keep in mind as you go through each stage of the cycle. Ultimately, you need to make sure you have the right information and policy mandates in place. You'll want to recover any indirect costs associated with the management, the oversight, the accountability, and the transparency of all the programs and expenditures. Before you start any of this, verify you actually have an approved negotiated indirect cost rate. If you don't, very strongly suggest to get a cost allocation plan and an indirect cost rate. Francesca, Franny, Will you take us through the last step to help tie all this together? Absolutely. Um, and in case you all haven't caught on by now, I um, have given Maria all of the hard slides to break down all of the <laughs> difficult um, numbers and everything as our um, one of our in-house grants nerds and, and specialists. So in case you didn't catch on to that, but um, it's amazing. She really um, knows her stuff and has been on the front lines of all of this. So thank you so much, Maria. Um, and I'm taking all the nice and easy peasy slides, but um, after you've basically gone through all of this hard work of assembling your team, preparing your appropriation and cost allocation plans, um, and getting your reporting mechanisms and indirect cost rate in order, um, at this final critical stage, the last thing you want to hear is your agency or department did not take sufficient actions to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse of assistant funds for whatever reason during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so in order to avoid this nightmare scenario, you need to have compliance built in and top of mind from the beginning of your grants process. That means, again, double checking all your records and ensuring they're up to date, including compliance reports, financial data, recent budgets, and any evaluation data, um, whether they're in progress or completed. So when your grantor or the inspector general visits, you can be prepared. Your grants coordinator will ideally want to help prepare for any on-site visits, um, like printing extra copies of blueprints or providing access to the job site for any inspections or photographs of progress. Um, because even though the federal government right now was doing everything it can to relax all the administrative and reporting requirements during COVID-19, it's much better for you, obviously, to err on the side of over-prepared rather than under. 
Um, but ultimately, we're confident that these five steps can at least help you um, start getting prepared and implement some immediate best practices and tools to navigate these unprecedented times. Um, so we hope that we'll have some time towards the end of this presentation um, today to directly answer some of the questions you all may have. Um, with that, thank you so much, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Emily from ELGL. Hey, thanks, Francesca. Um, Emily, this, this is Maria. Can I interject real quick? Yeah. So I have, I've seen a lot of questions come up on this 500,000 population uh, mm -hmm. issue. And so if you are under 500,000, you need to get with your state about getting funding. If you are a city within that 500,000 population of a county, you still need to get, you can't send in a certificate for yourself because you're not 500,000. So just be sure, um, and we can go, we can answer this at the end too, and we'll, we'll give out emails and you guys can, can email uh, your questions too and we'll answer those. Sorry, Emily, go ahead. No, you're good. Um, sorry, y'all, I'm pivoting from trying to answer all the questions I can in the chat. Um, so thank you everyone who is participating in that. It is really, really um, helpful for us to share our knowledge around this. Um, so I'm really glad to have um, all of you here today. Um, I work with ELGO, um, which is the hosting agency for this webinar. Um, we are the Engaging Local Government Leaders Association. Um, and I would just want to take two seconds and give a huge shout out to Maggie Jones, who is the um, Assistant Director of Community Development in Tarrant County, Texas, who really helped me pull a lot of this information together um, for you today. So thank you, Maggie, for being on um, and feel free to um, let me know if you have things that you want to add as I'm going forward and speaking. Um, given that, um, so you kind of saw the basic information earlier about the big pots of funding. Um, many of you, it seems from your chat, questions are already very familiar with this, but um, a good proportion of you are actually not people who work in grants world all the time. So what we wanted to do with this portion of the presentation is give you sort of the big picture of what's happening with all these federal agencies um, and kind of help you kind of get oriented and started in the right direction. And also to give you links to everything that we know of that's currently coming out. Um, there is one really big important thing to remember, which is that, um, if you'll go to my next slide, um, please, Francesca, thank you. Um, the biggest important thing to remember is that everyone is figuring this out at the same time. So this is a sort of unprecedented amount of money with lots and lots of changes to the rules, as Maria told you. Um, in many cases, a lot of the federal agencies that I've talked with and the state departments of those agencies that I've talked with don't have guidance yet either. So a lot of these numbers keep changing. Um, a lot of the implementation measures um, we'll hear, you know, three days ago it was going to be this way and now they're going to do it this way. So there's quite a bit of this that's um, all still being developed um, and we're doing the best we can to keep up with this information. So um, I know ELGL is tracking it on our website and um, eServices as well. So this page has links to all of the kind of big picture summaries that we used um, to keep track of this. So the Conference of Mayors, um, ICMA, um, the National League of Cities has some great stuff on there as well. Um, and then um, all of the estimates that we talked about earlier about the allocations that are coming down, um, that's linked for you there as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, Yes, and before I go on, you guys are going to get um, a copy of this PowerPoint. There's a link in the chat up there where you can download it as well, but you'll get this and the recording um, after the webinar is over, so you'll have all these links um, for yourselves to use. Um, so you do, if you are one of those um, local and tribal governments who's eligible for um, coronavirus relief fund that is due uh, tomorrow night by midnight. Um, and that link, uh, Emily Vanilla also shared in the chat for you as well. Um, this is somewhere, this is some of the programs that we know of where there's also additional funding on top of that coronavirus relief fund money that we talked a lot about earlier. So um, there's all kinds of ways that they're channeling these federal dollars through existing programs. Um, so for some programs, it seems like that's just gonna be 
an extension of what they're already doing, but maybe they're offering a second round of funding um, application windows in a couple of months, or they're extending and expanding the ones that were already open when this started. Um, the sort of big bucket ones on here that you can start watching for um, are going to primarily come from that disaster relief fund um, and also all of the HUD um, community development programs, um, which I think are on the next slide. Francesca, if you want to slide us forward. Um, so there's a ton of stuff happening through HUD um, and through CDBG specifically. Um, there is a list on their webpage. You can actually download all of the allocations and grants that they are making. Um, it's updated every couple of days. Um, and then they also have guidance there if you're dealing with questions about um, programs that you run, housing programs you run, homelessness programs, et cetera, and mortgage relief um, that is backed through HUD. Um, waivers are being released for many programs and there's guidance to that as well. Um, and then there's several other agencies. So um, the National Association of County Community and Economic Development Agencies and um, the National Community Development Association are both tracking a lot of this stuff and have great resources on their page um, as well. Um, and good examples as well, particularly on the NCDA page, if you are interested in doing something with an existing um, federal CDBG or other HUD funded grant, um, there's actually a way for folks to upload things that they have done. So if they've changed a fund around so they can make emergency grants to small businesses or if they've um, done something different, um, all of that is also on that NCDA website linked there for you. Um, and yes, great question, Edward. Um, we will do a copy. We'll pull all the questions out of the group chat so you'll have all those resources and there will be a um, link to that Google document um, in the email that we sent as a follow-up. Um, so what we were talking about earlier with the small business funding, so we did a webinar this morning um, through ELGL on small business and economic development resources. And um, while we were on the webinar, <laughs> they announced that um, one of these programs had run out of money already. So um, there's two different types of funding in the CARES Act for um, SBA, specifically for uh, small businesses. Um, there are two different ways that they're doing that. The one that ran out this morning is called the Paycheck Protection Program. It was offered through other lenders, not through SBA, um, and it was forgivable up to 75% if you used it to keep your employees paid during the pandemic. Um, but you had to hire them back right now and you had to implement that right away. Um, through that program, in less than 14 days, they approved over 1.6 million loans. They gave away $350 billion, and that's equivalent to 14 years worth of SBA funding. So that was a lot. It was a huge injection, um, but that was all the money that they had. And so what we heard this morning was that um, there is legislation underway to expand that up to $600 billion, um, but that that is stuck right now on partisan lines, um, which is probably not surprising, um, and also a really wild amount of money to think about in terms of lending. Um, so we don't know yet what's going to happen with that particular program. The other program that SBA is channeling their CARES Act funds through are economic is injury disaster loans, which is an existing program that they had that was designed to help people after hurricanes or wildfires or um, anything like that. Um, that's where they're pushing that money. Um, unfortunately, originally it was supposed to be, you can get $10,000 right now and this application is streamlined and it's really fast and easy. Um, that is not the case. They did make some changes to the application. Now it's an advance of up to $10,000 but only $1,000 per employee and not per contractor. So um, it, get, it got a little bit bogged down um, in the regulations and is a little bit more complicated than the Paycheck Protection Program was. Um, in addition to those two, I want you to be aware that there's lots of other business support funding coming out. It's just not here yet. Um, so for example, those of you who are in places with agriculture as a significant part of your economy, um, USDA both through rural development and through Farm Service Agency has several different programs that are coming out um, to expand or um, provide new funding for rural businesses, for farms, and for food-based businesses, including some supply chain businesses in that sector. Um, so there's lots of other places to sort of keep an eye on that. Um, next slide, Francesca, thank you. Um, 
USDA specifically, um, that may be helpful for some of you. So these are good examples on the next couple slides of how um, non-CRF, non-coronavirus relief fund, non-direct allocation funds are going to come out is through things like this. So um, for example, USDA added an additional 25 million and expanded the application windows for rural telemedicine and distance learning grants and loans. Um, they also expanded and extended broadband connectivity pretty significantly for rural communities. Um, so there's more money there. Um, that rural resource guide that's linked right there, I wanted to put in there because whether or not you actually are interested in USDA funding, they have everything in every federal agency that is relative to rural communities. So it's a very nice, one of the few kind of single go to this link and read this PDF uh, places that the federal agencies have put out yet. Um, next slide, please, Francesca. And then, um, so those numbers that um, someone asked about some clarification in earlier in the um, chat box. Um, so of, of what I was able to find in the CRF, the specific to emergency response and public safety are these breakdowns. Um, that is a little bit shifting. That's as of like three days ago, <laughs> but it'll depend entirely on how they decide, how all of these different agencies decide to do that implementation, um, particularly for competitive grant programs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to throw up a poll really quick while I take a glance at the chat and see if I can answer any questions. Um, and I would really like to know um, how we can support you with additional um, uh, resources. I'm sorry, I'm trying to do too many things at one time. Um, <laughs> do you guys do you have something you want to throw out from the chat while I'm taking a look? Yeah, I'll go ahead and throw it. I've posted to, I posted the treasury, the eligible uh, cities and counties in the chat box. I also posted the census data and the methodology, how they figured out how the states are going to get and the, the U.S. territory. So that's on there if you guys want to open that up and use it. If you can't open it, let me know and I'll, we'll figure out how to get it emailed or get it put out. Um, also, we have at eCivis, we have a um, COVID-19 toolkit that's available. There you go, that COVID-19 resource hub. So go on there and we keep things updated. Uh, we have a lot of uh, services and a lot of information out there for you. So that will help too. And then watch the blog on the eCivis.com. And we also post a lot of stuff on social media to help give you links and information that'll help deal with COVID. Thank you. Um, if I could just also add to that real quick, um, to all of these um, slides, at least from um, eCivis side, what Maria went through in terms of the breakdowns and the five steps are in our new playbook, Your Roadmap to COVID-19 Funding. It's um, free to download if you go to our COVID-19 Resource Hub. Um, so all of these plays here that um, you got today are accessible in this playbook and go way more in depth and break it down a bit. Um, so feel free to um, check that out as a resource and again reach out to us if you want to get that um, from us directly as well. Yeah and something else to throw out is that even though these cities and counties and the tribes and the territories are getting their share of this 150 billion doesn't mean that cities under 500,000 population and counties under 500,000 population can't go for funding. You may not get some of that funding, you can get it for your state, but there's also tons of grants out there um, that you can go for. And on our resource hub, we have an updated list of some of grant opportunities out there that are that are COVID related. So you can always check out there too. So you're not just because you're under 500,000, you're not out in the cold. Correct. And I think that's one of the things I noticed in the chat that we had so much um, so many questions about was what about everyone else. Um, the direct allocation is really only a a actually fairly small component of this. And so um, the other uh, materials and resources that we can share with you, um, just keep an eye on those places that you're already association members with or already work with, like the, you know, the National Conference of Mayors, National League of Cities, um, all those folks are all trying to track this and share information as fast as we get it, so. Yes. Yeah, it's an ever fluid, ever moving, uh, changing environment right now. So it'll definitely have lots of updates coming. 
So more webinars on the CARES Act, absolutely. More print and online resources, and those are coming out, and we're, we're adding to ours daily. I know that others are too. Um, a series of webinars on grant writing basics, yeah, that, that would be very helpful. More webinars on the types of grants outside of the CARES Act, that'd be great too. And each agency, okay, let me give you guys a website um, that I use daily to kind of help stay on top of this too for a bunch of that is the It's a Council on Government Relations, uh, www.cogr.edu. They have a lot of um, resources. Um, also, um, Marie, I want to jump back. So we have um, several questions coming in. We're gonna what we're gonna do with all of these, y'all, because we are um, we only have nine minutes left um, in the webinar. So I'm going to try to hit the high points really quickly, um, and then we will put a copy of questions and answers um, in our post when we do the recording. Um, what I would like to mention, um, and this is a good response, thank you, Elijah, for pointing it out. So um, just like with the SBA funding we talked about where we know that they are planning to add more money to that pot, um, they are also planning additional rounds, three, four, five, and six um, for stimulus funding. And so we don't know yet what those will look like. Um, I do think we've had enough interest, at least through ELGL, that we will continue to host um, webinars as each of these packages come out. And I do think, Elijah, that you are correct, um, that in those later rounds of stimulus funding, we will see a lot more of that expansion to existing programs, um, that they're going to be able to funnel more money through existing agencies to deal with some of the sort of, sort of non-immediate needs too. So one of the things that um, I, I hope is clear to you guys, and maybe we didn't mention earlier, but this particular package was intended to be very fast. It was intended to deal with a lot of red tape, get money to where it needed to go immediately. Um, but what some of those future rounds of funding are looking at is not just, you know, how do we keep small businesses afloat? Um, how do we help people in the very, very short term when they're having trouble accessing employment, when they're having trouble accessing food? Um, but then in the later rounds, it's much more about structural um, and sort of longer term um, impacts that we're seeing to the supply chain, to um, housing, both private and public, to um, anything like that that is going to be affected from here forward, particularly depending on what happens to the economy in the next six months. So I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of that funding is going to be much more accessible to um, all sizes of local um, and regional governments. Great. Um, the certification tomorrow, for those of you who have questions, um, that is also linked here and in the slides. Um, if you are over 500K and you don't send in the certification, you're going to have to work with your state. Um, if you do, then you are saying that you are ready to um, accept that. Thank you, Maria, for um, handling that. Correct, thank you, yes. Okay. The funding that's out now helps respond to actual COVID immediate costs, that's correct. And I did see a question that said, um, do, do, do certification, oh, where is it? Where's the best place to look for, for eligible expenses under this program? I know that there was some new guidance sent out to where they're gonna allow you to on certain agencies may allow you to reallocate some of your current fun, uh, grant funding to use for COVID funding or to use for COVID related expenses, but they also put out that you will not get more money to do that to help with your project that that grant originally um, paid or was supporting. So if you have questions on the expenses, look at your federal agency's website and they should have uh, and get with your program manager for your grant because even if the same agency could have two program managers that have two different um, programs and, and their allowable costs could be different. So get with the agencies for eligible expenses. 
And you'll also see that some of those agencies are working with um, larger groups of folks. So one of the resources we linked you to was the NACCED um, group that's um, Community and Economic Development. They are actually crowdsourcing a Google document of questions for HUD from people who are in these programs to say we need to know about X. Um, so those can also be a good place. They're answering some of those questions as they can, but it's also a good way to sort of channel that information to uh, the agencies administering those programs. All right, so if you're under 500,000, you'll work with your state because a state is the one who's going to have the funding. Correct. So if you're under 500,000, work with your state. You can, you can contact your county too if your county is over 500,000, but I don't think you're going to get funding from them. I think you'll get more funding from the state. Correct. And we did send you a link to the FFIS breakdown. It's in the chat and the slides, and that tells you how much each state um, is expected to get. Right. And whoever E6420 is, it says must send in a certification by 417 for what? That is for um, if you're the county or the city over 500,000, you have to send in your certification uh, to the Department of Treasury to get that, to get funding, direct funding. If not, you'll go through your state. Excellent. I'm going to close this poll, um, y'all, but thank you for filling it out. That was really, really helpful for us. Um, I think on the next slide, Francesca, we have um, contact information. So we'll leave this up while we're closing. Um, Ali, if you want to um, wrap us up. Great. Yeah. Um, so thank you all for being here today. And a huge thanks to Maria, Francesca, um, from eCivis and Emily for joining us and um, facilitating this conversation today. As a reminder, we'll have to, we have recorded today's webinar and we'll have it available online soon, um, along with slides and information from our chat. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member of ELGL, you may do so at elgl.org slash membership. Uh, it's $40 a year and you get all of the perks of being on these great webinars as well as uh, many other um, events and things that happen throughout the year. Um, you can also reference the hashtag, hashtag ELGL webinar on Twitter to review and share your thoughts from today's discussion. And with that, I'll end today's webinar. Thank you all for your support of ELGL. Thank you, guys. Thank you.